This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best selling book What School Could Be. This is the What School Could Be podcast. I am your host, Josh Rapoon. Before we start the show, please consider joining the What School Could Be global online community. Go to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or simply install the What School Could Be app on your smart device. I look forward to seeing you there. Today, my guest is Brendan McCarthy. Brendan's resume is complicated, so bear with me. He is currently working on a master's in education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Prior to that, he has degrees from Parsons School of Art and Design and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He also taught at Parsons, which is what we are going to focus on today. His undergraduate degree in mathematics is from Columbia University, and he graduated as the valedictorian at Gonzaga College High School. Recently, he was a scholar in residence at Hanahaoli School here in Honolulu, and he is working on an informal degree in surfing, love, and fun. Among the zillions of interesting things about Brendan's life and work as an educator, we note that he was born in Nairobi, Kenya. Let's hear briefly from three people who know Brendan well. Neil Gilks, a director at Parsons School of Art and Design wrote, He is by far one of the most effectual, insightful, inspirational, and committed professionals that I have encountered in my entire career. Working alongside him is an education at every level of the role, from the minutiae of planning to the broadest of blue sky aspirations, Brendan McCarthy is the professional that we should hold up as the gold standard. Leah Wu, head of school at Hanahaole, where Brendan was a scholar in residence, wrote, Brendan and I enjoyed many conversations reflecting about the value and role of schools in our society and the many unique ways schools could spark passion, ignite lifelong learning, and unite us together in helping create a better future society. I look forward to following Brendan's professional journey as he is poised to transform teaching and learning. He has certainly helped our school community recalibrate and reconnect as we emerged from a global pandemic, and he helped me venture into the clouds to dream about the possibilities. And finally, Jonathan Lee, one of Brendan's former students at Parsons wrote, he taught me that I could use this fashion industry for change, to understand that it could be used as a vessel to address critical issues like social and economic reform. Brendan taught me that I could use my skills and profession to not only have a career, but to build up communities that I love and care about. And now, my listeners, fasten your seatbelts. Here's my conversation with Brendan McCarthy. Brendan, welcome to the What School Could Be podcast. Hi, Josh. Thanks so much for having me today. It's a it's a pleasure. Been looking forward to this for a long time, brother. So we're gonna we're gonna have some fun here over the next hour. Fantastic. Okay, so Brendan, I've never done this before, but I'm going to start and end this hour long conversation with opportunities for you to give shout outs to meaningful people in your life. So who is Mr. Michael Howell and in what ways do you carry your experiences with him in your backpack while you continue to grow as a learner, a teacher, a guide, a coach, a mentor, and a seeker of new pathways? Sure. Michael Howell is a really special person in my life. He was my first mathematics teacher at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C., where I went to high school, uh, he taught me geometry. I had a father who loved mathematics, you know, tried to instill it in me my whole life, worked a lot with me on it. But for some reason, when I got to Mr. Howe's class, he was teaching me geometry. It just, everything opened up with mathematics for me. It was the first time, I think, also I had encountered a teacher who was teaching a, 
an incredibly rigorous, hardcore subject, but just with the most amount of care and kindness and love, just an incredible human. Later, I guess towards the end of my high school journey, I, I learned he had gone in his own life through some incredible challenges, um, some of the most extraordinary things that a human can face. And maybe in, in that sense, it helped him be an incredible teacher. But for me, yeah, I carry him, yeah, absolutely, in my backpack and try to be maybe half the teacher he is, but just leading with kindness and love. But also, I guess, with that unbelievable rigor in mm -hmm. mathematics that he was able to show me. Were there any particular ways that he worked to make geometry relevant to your life? Or was it really just his approach with kindness and how much he cared about his students and about you? Yeah, I think that idea of relevance was something Mr. Howell and, and a lot of great teachers work on. I think for me, he was really good at providing, maybe I could say like like a polyvalent environment, not just for me, but but for all the students in our class. He he brought plenty of mathematics and what he loved. He was actually the baseball coach. Well, mm -hmm. so there's a heck of a lot of baseball <laughs> it sure talk. Is. Yeah. <laughs> But but I felt like I, I had an open space in that class to bring who I am, what I cared about, and figure out how to fit that into mathematics. And I think it was, you know, his openness around that and trying to get to know us as human beings. I felt like I left high school and I, I know that Mr. Mr. Michael Howell, he knew me as a human being and as a mathematician really well. Mm. Wow, that sounds awesome. You know, it's just such a good feeling when you think back on your on the teachers in your life and that the the most important thing that you can say about them is that they knew you or that they know you. Yeah. And I, I've had a few in my life, just a few, but wow, did they really know me? And I just like, I lock on to that, you know? It's just, it's a very special feeling. I think it's maybe the feeling that we would want to have about teachers in our lives is that they were very, very close to us, or at least that they knew us really well. So that's great. So Brendan, as a way for our listeners to get to know you, I'm going to ask you to make a choice, possibly a terribly impossible choice. So <laughs> let's say that you are free from noon to 2 p.m. today, and money is not much of an object, and you can pick only one thing to do from the following list, okay? So, okay. so here's the list. The waves are up, and you can go surfing. The sun is out, and you can either go play tennis or go golfing. A friend has invited <laughs> you to sit and have several cups of Sri Lankan tea. You can spend a couple hours doing yoga, or you can plan a trip to either Kenya or South Africa. And I'm sorry, you can only pick one, sir. <laughs> so what is your choice <laughs> and why? Oh, uh, wow. That's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You know, I, it's funny. I, I'll just go with what my heart says, and um, I would paddle out. I would surf. There's something about surfing. I came to it late in life, Josh. It's I, I didn't grow up by the beach or anything like that. We did spend a little time at the water, but yeah, it just something. Literally, when you said that word, the waves are up, and yeah, I could paddle out. I, I didn't really care what you said after that, which is <laughs> which may not mean i'm a great human but uh yeah it's a it's a special thing in my life and transformative it permeates a lot of the ways i think and try to relate to others and the people i love actually it's a solitary activity mm. but the second i get in from the ocean i find myself calling the most important people in my life which is a thing i've just started noticing that i do but it's wow. yeah, i think that's significant wow do you recall the very very first time that you like engaged with the waves at a beach as a budding surfer? Yes. <laughs> I was in Newport Beach. Mm. told my father I was taking a year off from grad school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned uh, to him I, at the time I was at Newport Beach, but uh, I took... I took my first surfing lessons at a small break there called Blackies. And mm. it just, there was something, it's not a great wave. Uh, no one's ever, ever written articles about it. But something kicked in. I had a job in New York at this amazing art gallery. I, I came back, I quit it, and I immediately moved to the West Coast to surf. <laughs> mm, wow. What was behind that? What was driving you to, to make that decision, which is obviously every parent's nightmare, you know? I'm leaving grad school. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's interesting. I think I just, I was studying architecture at the time and mm -hmm. I did love it. 
but I didn't love it with capital L. I knew actually I just needed a little time. I was on a sprint in life. I had accomplished a lot of amazing things already. I was really young, but I had still gone to some fancy schools, had some amazing jobs that, you know, people really, really fight hard for. But after all that sprint, after accomplishing a lot of those fancy things, I just, I knew I needed a little time in the ocean, surfing, a little bit of getting out of the East Coast bubble, maybe all Mm. were calling me and that, yeah, that was the impetus time. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I, you know, I think a lot about how we have constructed a culture in which everything seems to be a headlong rush. And we'll get into this later in terms of, you know, our our K-12 experience and then our higher education experiences, where we just feel like we have to race as fast as possible to the end. And I've been thinking a lot over the last few years, Brendan, about just those moments where I know they're scary for your parents, you know, but the idea of just suddenly kind of stopping and saying, maybe I need to do something else. Maybe something else is calling me in this moment. It's not that I'm quitting anything. I'm just, you you know, picking a different waypoint at this moment. And so I love that that happened to you. And it must have been significant in terms of the rest of the journey so far, right? Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there with this idea of time. I think we need different amounts of time. Sometimes doing things really fast, doing a quick project or a yeah. drawing in 10, 10 seconds is amazing. And it, it results in a certain quality of outcome. I don't mean good or bad. I mean like a characteristic mm-hmm. that the time that you take to do something is actually expressed in the outcome or the work. But yeah, I I think for me, um, surfing, what's beautiful is it's brought me to, you mentioned Sri Lankan tea. It's brought me to Sri Lanka and I've made the most extraordinary friends there. It's brought me, I've surfed in Senegal when I was working on academic projects there around building schools. I've, it's brought me to Hawaii and this incredible incredible place and this incredible program at the university here around progressive education. So yeah, yeah, in that sense, it's done a lot for me. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. So more getting to know you stuff. So Brendan, climate change has forced us humans to abandon Earth and head into space to live the rest of our lives as celestial and interstellar nomads, a la, you know, 2001 <laughs> A Space Odyssey. So you have, Brendan, mere seconds to decide before the spaceship launches on one record album to bring with you. And your choice <laughs> will be either from the works of Aretha Franklin, Julio Iglesias, Pearl Jam, or Radiohead. So the clock is ticking. What is your decision, <laughs> sir? And what does your choice tell us about the genetic code that makes up Brendan McCarthy? (laughs) I love it. What a beautiful question. I would say, again, I I don't even have to think about it. Those are all incredible options, but it would be Julio Iglesias. Really? So when I was growing up, Mm -hmm. my dad, he worked in Argentina a lot and he was learning Spanish at the time. I was, he, he had me in Spanish classes in school. I was obsessed with Diego Maradona. That was sort of the eighties and the height of this incredible football player and Spanish became like integral part of my life. And I had so many friends, family, friends, and people. I still remember Senorita Cova Rubios teaching me Spanish in second grade. And just ever since, you know, because of that love of Spanish and language and culture, I've connected, but I also love Julio because he sings these terrible love songs. Mm. They're so bad and they're so good <laughs> and, and they, they permeate like all of culture. And so, yeah, for me, I love this sort of, you know, global connection or international connection, language, relationship probably with my dad, but also this these ideas of these maybe saccharine love songs um, that somehow they, they get to a certain truth for me, maybe a certain ubiquity of love songs in our world. I even made a, terrible art piece when I was a grad student called Family Matters with Julio singing a cover of I Want to Know What Love Is. (laughs) Wow, got it. And, you know, one of the things that I really wonder about is, you know, I kind of go back to what you said a minute ago about when you come out of the waves, your impulse is to connect with somebody that is meaningful in your life. And I find that that happens to me when I 
you know, listen to a piece of music that really moves me. And, and you know, oftentimes I listen to music while I, while I bike. I'm a distance biker. And so I'll hear something. And then as soon as I get back, I'm like, I'm going to text it to my daughter. And she's probably, you know, just <laughs> going, oh, geez, here we go again. You know, one of these songs. But there's something about the sharing of it that's meaningful, right? And I, I wonder what you think about that. I love that. I was just visualizing. I'm I'm looking out at a road that goes up into the mountains. I was thinking about you on that ride and, and what you're listening to and the the cadence of your your pedaling. Yeah, yeah. I I, I feel I feel that just as you were speaking. And for me, it was weird. For the longest time, I was always trying to paddle out with people. I was always trying to make friends. And surfing's kind of a funny culture. If you're not that great at it, people don't really love surfing with you. Yeah, especially in amazing places. Weirdly, once I did start paddling out with people, I realized how much I loved actually being out there on my own. Not totally by myself. There's other folks out there, but just not knowing anyone. But when I get in, yeah, exactly what you said. I find myself ready, able, excited to reach out and not so much talk about what I did out there or what I don't never, we're never chatting about the waves or anything. It's mostly, I just get this instant urge to call the people I love, to text the people I love. It's weird. I, I'll sit in the parking lot, drinking water, hydrating, and just just there for like hours, just hanging out, just literally chatting with those those folks that mean the most to me. And I just started kind of becoming a lot more aware of that. Mm, yeah, that's really neat. I, I've come to terms with the idea that well, maybe put, let me put it this way. I've, I've had some regrets in my life that I didn't do more team type sports, you know, even as an adult, why didn't I go play basketball at the local, you know, at the local court or why didn't I join a biking club or anything like that? And I think now here at age 64, when I'm 64, I'm just fine with being alone with the workouts that I do. It's just my time to process and to listen. Yeah. I think that's it. I think I'm just going to be okay with that. I'm going to embrace that. So it's very cool. Nice. So, Brendan, one of the things that I love about doing these interviews with educators is probing their philosophies of education. And your philosophy of education appears to be based on three questions. Who do you love? What community do you love? What are the dreams of people and community you love? So how do these three questions translate into real approaches to real learners? Like, in what ways do you carry these questions into any situation where you are guiding or mentoring, coaching, advising, and or teaching learners? You know, it's funny. I get asked for my syllabi a lot in different contexts. And when I share it, it's pretty much those questions that you read. And people are like, yeah, but how do you teach this systems design engineering course? Or how did you teach mathematics, you know, in seventh grade with this syllabus? It doesn't make any sense. But Sort of my approach around it is maybe back to that question about Michael Howell and how he set up a polyvalent world for you know a lot of content, a lot of incredible geometry that Michael taught, but he allowed us to bring who we are and what we loved and what we cared about into the classroom in different ways. And that opened up the beauty of geometry and mathematics for me in such an extraordinary way. And I think I try to do something you know similar, but my sense is that Let's say we're designing something. I, I taught at design school, the Parsons School in New York for a long time. And my feeling is that if you design something with someone you care about and you do it in a collaborative way and you understand who they are and what they care about and what they're dreaming, almost by definition, whatever you're going to make is going to be extraordinary because it's based on two people's interests, loves, or a community's love. So that's what I'm, I'm interested in first. And then I'm interested in mapping, analyzing all of those things that people, those that the dreams that you talked about, the mm-hmm. critical issues and the significant challenges facing people and communities, and really analyzing those first before we go into any set of systems design or any project so that all of the decisions we make from that point on can map to those values. Mm-hmm. And I think it's that, that decision-making and value constellation that guides 
a lot of incredible work that some of my students have done. Mm. Would it be fair to say, Brendan, that as you embark on this journey with your students, that the questions that guide the thing forward, these three questions, and I'm sure that there are others, and then the mapping process is what starts to build relationships amongst all of you as you move forward into the design process? Like, is that, is that kind of, is that intentional or is that what's happening as you move forward is that you're really getting to know each other as you do the mapping process of figuring out what's actually happening out there and what do people care about and what do they want to work on? You you nailed it, Josh. Absolutely. I think there's this idea sometimes that you go to a school or you get in a room, uh, four walls, whatever it is, and you're going to do something for outside of it. And what I try to figure out is what you said, is what are those relationships with the people you love? And that may be, in in most cases at, at the university I taught at, that was outside of those walls. The communities people loved were far, in many cases, international, in fact. But when you're sharing those and that's in that mapping process and that analysis, we do it in a collaborative fashion through critique, through discussion, through review. You start to understand who else is in the room, what else people care about. You start to be able to share references. You also, you know, and on the simplest level, you start to relax mm. when you get to know someone. You start to find connection. And for me, that idea of like having fun, relaxing, and we do a lot around food, you know, and, I, mm. and I, those are very serious, heavy questions. Who do you love? We, I do a lot of like, what do you just like to eat? <laughs> where, where are you going yeah. to dinner tonight? Where, what are we having? And I think, I think that builds those relationships you're referencing and mm. makes people feel relaxed. And when you're relaxed, you can take risk mm. and you can do some special things because you know you got a bunch of people around you who know you mm. and know your intentions. Like those decisions are based on love. So even if you disagree with them, we're okay. We're mm. in the room together and we're going to figure it out. Mm. So, Brendan, before we go to break, I just I want to come at this from a slightly different direction. I don't want to put you on the spot, but let's just imagine, you know, that there's, I I don't know, there's a a public high school chemistry teacher who's listening to this and saying to herself, I don't know, I don't know how to incorporate this into what I do. I'm so, you know, I'm so much in a situation where the curriculum is already laid out and I have to work my way through this content. And, and she's wondering, like, what's a step that I can take even to begin to approach what you're talking about here? I know that's hard, but... No, I, th- I think that's, that's the, the absolute right question because I didn't wake up and design that syllabus. Yeah. <laughs> like for my first class, those, those are years and years of me working through it. But I, I also, just to be really specific about that example, you know, I was a math major in college and I deeply appreciate the rigor and the almost objectivity sometimes of some of those scientific subjects or quantitative subjects. And yeah, it could sound a little almost pie in the sky idea. Who do you love? Well, we got to learn what a polyvalent bond is. Yeah. But for me, I, I think maybe just taking a step back to that thing I just mentioned before about how do you get a classroom where people are relaxed? And for me, that's critical. And you mentioned something about Mr. Howell when I, when I graduated that he, he might've known me. Yeah. And I think that idea of, you know, you could study, you know, I studied geometry in this class. You could leave a class and have a, a rigorous understanding of geometry and your teacher wouldn't know you. In my case, I had a rigorous understanding of geometry and my teacher knew who I was, knew what I cared about, allowed me to bring what I cared about into my work. And then the discipline of mathematics opened up in the most extraordinary way. And I saw a world, a set of potential beyond beyond the Pythagorean theorem or whatever it was that had the inner beauty of mathematics linked to who I am, what I cared about, and the communities I cared about. And that extraordinary link of that beautiful discipline has opened up so much. I became a math major, mm. you know, based on that. So I guess back to that just key point is first developing rapport and finding ways to understand who's in your classroom, to build trust and to relax, to understand that this complexity of, let's say, chemistry in that case can be negotiated or navigated together uh, as a team or ohana. Yeah, that's awesome. Well said, well said. 
So, hey everyone, stay with us. We'll be right back with more questions for Brendan McCarthy. Hi, fellow educators. I'm Steve Shapiro, and like you, I'm excited about the possibilities of what school could be. Please check out my podcast, Experience Matters, where I talk to guests ranging from big national thinkers like Daniel Pink and Tony Wagner to recent high school graduates about the most profound learning experiences of their youth. Then we dig into the implications for how we can reshape schools to produce powerful breakthrough learning for all of our students. Education can take many forms, but whatever form it takes, experience matters. Hey there. Are you interested in hearing weekly conversations with authors, leaders, and practitioners at the forefront of learning and education innovation? Then you'll love the Getting Smart podcast. This podcast amplifies the incredible work being done by some of the most innovative minds in education. Learn new leadership styles, new technologies, new frameworks and mindsets, and get the fuel you need to stay motivated and curious. Together, we can empower all learners to thrive. It's available at gettingsmart.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, friends. This is Toy Hirschman from Entre Ed. It is my great honor to uplift this excellent podcast, What School Could Be. As always, we are super excited to support innovation in education. We've been lucky enough to feature some of the incredible What School Could Be educators on our podcast. If you are looking to be inspired by entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial educators and other great minds from across the world, check out the Entre Ed Talk podcast and please like and subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. Hey everyone, we are back with Brendan McCarthy, who, frankly, is hard to describe in one sentence, so I'm not even going to try. So, Brendan, you shared with me a film you made titled The Emotional Running Project, and in the film, you, dressed in a black and white tux and mostly wearing red shoes, run a la Forrest Gump, what appears to be across the United States. So the person <laughs> filming you is in a truck with a very loud engine and the camera is pointed <laughs> out the window at you running and running and running in your tux. So frankly, Brendan, I could not stop laughing during these 29 minutes as I watched this film. But here's my question. Like, what were you running from and what were you running towards? There's my question. That's a beautiful question. So the impetus for the film... I think might help us. I I was an artist in residence in a small town, a sort of post-industrial East Coast town. The industry had left and there's this art residency there. There are very few jobs, but there's this wonderful artist residency. And I was just exploring the region, sort of the East Coast. There's an amazing, very expensive boarding school, some of the, one of the most famous in the U.S. right up there. There's another town right next door that has extremely, extremely low socioeconomic sort of demographics. There's a huge Guatemalan community of immigrants. So there's this unbelievable nexus of incredible wealth, privilege, and this extraordinary sort of post-industrial East Coast immigration situation. And it just troubled me that all there was so much proximity and so much inequity. And I I didn't know how to deal with it, but I think about how to address it and there all these macro systemic issues. And I just started running one day. Hmm. And I just thought back to that question that you asked earlier, you know, who are the people you love? Who are the communities you love? I had asked someone in the, the town I was in, I said, hey, have you ever been to that Guatemalan diner next in the town next door? They're like, no, I've never heard of it. I was like, great, we're running there. And I just, <laughs> it was just about connecting with hmm. people and places and showing the proximity of incredible challenge with incredible resource. And that those are the only things I was thinking about. And I didn't know how to, you know, you have a huge systemic issue, you don't know how to fix it. I just started running and I thought I'd just put something out there that mm. hopefully, yeah, could make people laugh, made people ask questions. Where is that? I know that. I didn't know that was there. Oh, that's mm. amazing. You know, those incredible humans speak Spanish there. I could learn Spanish and I could understand about Guatemalan food and then all oh, the amazing boarding schools over there. What's going on? Why is this? Why aren't we talking to each other? Mm. There are sequences in the film, though, that are that look like they were shot, you know, in Newport Beach. Yeah. Was that part of it as well? Did it expand into sort of connecting the various nexus points of this particular area to something much, much bigger? Absolutely. There's a whole sequence in Los Angeles. I had spent a lot of time 
around Los Angeles and Southern California. And that's one of the things I love, you know, wherever I go are the incredible proximities of different cultures and neighborhoods and communities. And that sort of underpinning of social justice and the questions around it um, for me and the proximity that we all have to each other and the ability to connect uh, that hopefully can transcend some of these challenges. That, for me, Los Angeles is a great example uh, of that as well. But I, I wanted to juxtapose it to this very rural area that people might not understand that it's not about necessarily urban density or anything like that. There's, you know, there are mm -hmm. people and communities with unbelievable dreams that are right next to each other, no matter where you are. So yeah, I tried to create a counterpoint with those two extreme, you know, environments in the U.S. That's so cool. I mean, we could literally spend, I could have easily built, you know, 20 questions just out of this 29 minute film. And I think, you know, I want to move on to another film in a second here, but I think what's really cool here is that, you know, for any of our educators who are listening, oftentimes the most beautiful thing that happens in teaching and learning is when students actually explain the work that they made. And your explanation was like mesmerizing in that moment as I was just, my brain started to just fire off as I was thinking about all these connections that you were making. And so I just think, Brendan, about the idea that it's not really enough just to make something in any context or to write a paper or, you know, to make some sort of a project or something like that. What's really important is that you explain it, that you be able to interpret it for people who are asking, right? I wonder what you think about that. I would say like, great works of art or, you know, really amazing academic things, all these things we study, they have an invitation embedded in them. Yeah. And so I think in terms of that idea of explanation, I think when you're making a work, you know, it's wonderful if there's a set of questions that whomever is engaging it might have. And at any given moment, like if when I was, you know, I've taught seventh grade mathematics, I'd say 90% of the room was trying to figure out what the 10% of the room already knew about a certain project. Right. And so I think not only ex explaining something, but setting up an environment of exchange where we're able to invite people to engage in whatever work we're doing, but also to make sure, back to that idea of being relaxed, having fun, that we're able to have a way to ask questions and to understand things. And then... The other thing is to build on it. Yeah. And I, I just met someone at the Penn conference recently, the Progressive Education Conference, you know, like to get a group of runners now uh, going on around this emotional running project, uh, some people with shared beliefs, you know, mm. anyway, sorry, yeah, I digress. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I love that. And now you've just given me such a gift here because I love that idea of everything that you do is an invitation. That's something I can carry with me after today is just thinking about the things that I do or the things that any learner, young learner does, each one of those things is an invitation to have a conversation about what it means and, and its context and, and the connection points and all that. That's awesome. So, okay, totally off the wall question that comes from a video you made about creating a school. So, and I'm sorry, Brendan, I went through that thing you know, literally frame by frame because <laughs> yeah. I was like searching through and looking at all these things. So inspired by watching in the film a hand writing in a journal, what does it mean to make something by hand for someone you love? And also, sorry, this is multi-part from this short film. What is the best, most expansive, most generative learning experience of your life so far? Like who was the person who taught you in this experience and what was the setting, the context, the conditions? What did you feel as you were in the middle of this generative learning experience? That's a film I made relatively recently. I was trying to figure out you know, what it might be like to start a school um, and how one might go about it, you know, just like yourself. And I, I know a lot of people that are listening and part of our community. We're always trying to figure out whether it's, you know, how are we going to teach tomorrow? How do we respond to the next lesson? I, I just sat down one day and I was like, well, what would happen if I started a school with people I love? What would that look like? Mm -hmm. And I just, I was in a cafe in Brooklyn and I just started writing down the names 
of people I love. And then I was like, it, I wasn't worried about a curriculum or what that school would look like. And I just tried to figure out who are those people. Mm. And what, like, you know, if your friends, imagine just a bunch of friends got together and, it, you know, a bit of a conceptual exercise. And I started sending them notes. Some of them were on WhatsApp. Some of them were emails. Some of them were calls. However, I, I knew that they liked to communicate with me, not in a business way or any like professional way, but just more on a personal level. And I just sent those questions out to them. I wanted to know what their greatest learning experience was. Mm. And, and I just asked them to send me like a little video about it. And, you know, who are the people that were involved in that learning experience? And I just got all these amazing videos from people that I love about these special experiences and that started to put together a foundation for maybe what a school could be in my mind. This mm. amazing agglomeration of all the people in my life that have meant something really important to me. And imagine all that went into a school. There's nothing else, just love. And what you referenced, that very first thing you referenced about a hand in the film, what happens if you make something by hand for someone you love. That's actually my partner writing that. That's Isabel Webster, who mm -hmm. is an educator, an extraordinary artist and thinker. And for her, making things by hand is the most important thing. It's an act of love. It's an act of expression of identity. And that was her response in a way to the, the prompt. That one, that was really amazing. And, and, you know, again, all of those, those extra questions that I added in were actually drawn directly from a text message that was rolling across the screen as, and I was just thinking, wow, this is really, really neat. And I guess, Brendan, in some ways I was feeling a little bit like, I wish I had gone to a fine arts school out of, you know, <laughs> out of high school, but that was never, I was never encouraged to do that. And I had mm -hmm. never even been encouraged to take an art or design class in high school. And I think that's part of the equation as well, is, you know, the extent to which we encourage kids to explore every part of learning and that we've been so locked into the subject areas, you know, for such a long time. So anyway, that film was was very, very cool. So that kind of leads me to, you know, a moment here where I asked you to share with me in advance of today the big meta 30,000 foot questions on your mind right now. And you wrote out nine of them. And so <laughs> I decided to try, and this was really fun for me, to synthesize all nine into one, which I'm going to toss back at you now. So here goes. So Brendan, from a neuroscientific perspective, if doing what we love to do for fun helps us learn better, how can we locate what different people love to do for fun? There you go. That's your question. <laughs> <laughs> Real softball, Josh. Thanks. Yeah, uh, real softball. <laughs> <laughs> How long do we have? Uh, no, I I appreciate it. It's you're right. That is the like, synthesis of many questions that are on my mind, and I I think a lot about, of course, this concept of love. And just like you asked that question about, you know, what what happens if you're a chemistry teacher in a, in a school that's locked into a very rigorous curriculum, and there are tests, and got to you know make sure we get through these things. I really wanted to get rigorous about this question about love and fun that I sort of think, you know, do we really actually learn better? Let's say even in those maybe rather objective subjects like mathematics or chemistry, if we're doing what we love and have, having fun. So I've been looking at the neuroscience of it, but I think for me that it seems the, the research is out there that it is fairly clear that yes, love and doing love, what you love and having fun is very important for your brain and learning. But then that question, the, the core of the question you just asked is the one that I'm left with is, okay, well, that's great, but everyone's different. Everyone loves different things. Everyone has fun doing different things. How do we locate that? How do we help each other locate those things? And then maybe if we even get a chance to locate it, then we have a shot at designing curriculum, learning experiences, schools. But that location device, what is that locating device? And for me... I just took a risk recently with 217 
children in Honolulu. Mm. And we just started making movies about what we love to do. Mm. And we, we spent a whole year just making movies about what we love to do. And that, that device of location became filmmaking. Mm. And then the second sort of secret device was philosophical discourse around those films that we made and the concepts of love and fun. So yeah, that's, that's a long answer. So I'll shut up. Mm. Well, actually, what I would love for you to do, because you, you actually had already moved us into the next question, which was your time as a scholar in residence at Hanahaole School, which is a small yeah. progressive school in Honolulu that was founded in 1918 and is very much a, a kind of John Dewey school. So what, what did it mean to be a scholar in residence? And what was this line of inquiry that you did with the 217 students around what is love? And how did that translate into a film festival, which is really a very cool idea when you think about it with 217 elementary school kids? Yeah, it was, first of all, just an extraordinary experience. And so I was a scholar in residence, as you mentioned, at the Hanahaoli School here in Honolulu. And it's through a partnership with the University of Hawaii and the grad program here, the Progressive Philosophy and Pedagogy Program. And so, I, you know, as part of my research, I was a resident there. And when I first joined the school, I was sort of searching for a project, you know, scholar in residence. That sounds really noble and epic and it does. amazing. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> right. This guy, this guy came from New York. He's a fancy boots professor and has all these <laughs> degrees and, we got 217 kids that want to learn and they're way smarter than Brendan. <laughs> so, and that was for me a really key moment, just my first day there. And I, and I immediately knew I just, back to that surfing thing, yeah. needed time. I wanted just to spend time. I just wanted to hang out. And what I ended up doing, and I hope they have the most amazing head of school, Leo Wu, but I hope I didn't stress Leo out. But for literally two months, I hung out at recess I went to lunch. I had tea on, they have this like beautiful balcony. I would just have like these open teas there and hope someone like a teacher would drop by. And honestly, I was just trying to get to know folks and trying to get to in people's head. And there was a moment, Josh, a magic moment mm. on the playground one day. Evie B, the most incredible student, came up to me and said, hey, has anyone ever told you you look like Willy Wonka? <laughs> <laughs> And so for your listeners, I do have some pretty crazy, like curly hair. and Mm -hmm. I have gotten that before, but I didn't want to give that away. I said, well, why do you ask? And she said, well, you know, you look like Willy Wonka. And I said, well, uh, well, interesting. That's, I don't know where the manners exist in that question, but I think there's a good heart behind it. And I said, well, do you like chocolate? And she was like, yeah, (laughs) I do like chocolate. Obviously I'm, I'm seven years old. And then I said, well, I just got out of one of my first meetings with your head of school, Miss Wu, and uh, she said her favorite thing in the world is chocolate, too. And Evie's face just lit up. She's like, no way. Miss Wu, the head of school, also loves what I love? (laughs) And it was at that moment I just thought, I said, Evie, do you want to design a chocolate class with me? We could design it all around biodiversity and aloha aina and farm to table strategies. He was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, okay, don't, don't worry. We'll get to that. And that's when sort of the light bulb went off. I said, well, what if we just literally made films and figured out, like, if I'm going to really get to know these folks, if I'm going to observe and really understand and try to develop something, I got to get in there. And I thought, well, what if we just make some films about mm. what we love and talk about them and hang out? So that's how it started. Mm. That's just amazing. And to our listeners, I'm actually going to put in the show notes a link to a wonderful blog that you wrote as part of the Hanahole Center for Professional Development. They have a wonderful blog page and people guest write for that page. And Brendan, your blog on that just set off lots of fireworks for me. And I, I love the idea and you can, you can actually follow this in the blog because you've included many photos in that blog, which is great, of how this tracked towards this kind of one-minute film festival, which is great because then, you know, it's, it's not like you're sitting there watching 10, you know, 12, 15-minute films on what love is. You're actually seeing these little bursts of energy, these little bits of philosophical, ex- these little philosophical explosions, right? And I haven't even seen the film yet. I'm just imagining what it was like. So before we go to break, can you briefly share with us what the festival was like? What did, like, were flies, flies on the wall? What was that like? 
So pretty special. You can picture yourself, like all of us educators getting to school really early, setting up screens, being really stressed out, getting (laughs) it ready. But we tried to get there before any student got there. And and we got these enormous screens, like it was essentially like a drive, imagine a drive-in movie theater as a main screen in a courtyard and all these LED screens, LCD screens around the side. And as students came in, it was really emotional. I didn't know how it would go. But you know, oftentimes before school, kids are kind of bleary eyed. They they jump in their classrooms or they're playing on the playground a little bit. One by one, a gathering just started. This is before a Friday assembly. So assembly happens much later, but right. all of a sudden we had a mass of these amazing humans watching the films of their friends, mm-hmm. hugging each other, laughing. And I have to add, Josh. So this, we, we ended up playing this film festival and we, we actually got the films down to 30 seconds. I know you appreciate that <laughs> as an editor. Yes. So they were exactly that, these bursts of very direct, unequivocal ideas. And they were iterated. They were developed over the course of an entire semester of what they loved. And the secret here, I think, was really what happened after it. We had this amazing discussion and reflection by the students about what they learned about love through other people's eyes, and also what they thought could be possible at Hanahaoli for new learning experiences. And Hanahaoli is already an incredible school, certainly based on love, but they were just throwing out these amazing ideas in this discussion about where we could go from here as a community, as a school, as a a set of curriculum co-designers, the children and the faculty and the faculties gathered. And for me, that was the extraordinary part is what we do with this living dynamic archive of what the children have told us they love. Mm-hmm. Because from that, that's the liftoff point. Like that wasn't the end. So the exhibition was not the end. It was what you talked about earlier, the explanation, the unpacking, the invitation. And then we're in that rocket ship because oh. now we can do something extraordinary, but the children are leading what our learning experiences are going to be and actually co-designing them right there, telling us what class they want based on what they just saw. Right, right. And one of those classes is going to be around chocolate, of course, right? 100%. 100%. The Willy Wonka <laughs> chocolate factory class. <laughs> So, Brendan, there's there's nothing left to do at this point but go to break. We just need to give our listeners, give their brains a little bit of a break. I'm sure all cylinders are firing. So, so stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back with more questions for Brendan McCarthy. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Aaron Shorn, a previous guest on this very podcast. I am also now head of growth and community at Hawaii's own Unruler. Unruler is a collaborative mobile and web platform that accelerates innovation, grows culture and community, and celebrates learning. Learners post multimedia, tag their learning, and through comments are able to work together asynchronously. Each post is a moment of learning that forms the foundation of a joyous learning journey. We can be found at UNR. ULR.com. Mahalo. Hey everyone, we are back with Brendan McCarthy, currently a graduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's College of Education and a former professor at the Parsons School of Art and Design in New York. So, Brendan, my family members have been involved with the Special Olympics over the many years. And so I was really moved to read about your work just as the pandemic overwhelmed the world around fashion and the Special Olympics. And I shared this with several colleagues and we all agreed that this Parsons partnership with the Special Olympics is just like flat out insane, awesome. And so (laughs) what is it, sorry, multi-part question here. What is it, how did it begin? What is the emerging partnership with Nigel Barker. How does 3D design software come into play? Who is Emmy Fries? 
And <laughs> where might we find the densest strands of Brendan McCarthy's DNA in this collaboration? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, just thank you for for mentioning that work. It's it's definitely one of the the most amazing projects and partnerships I've ever got to be involved in. And as a teacher, certainly one of the most meaningful. So I had worked a lot around principles of co-design and thinking about how, uh, you know, at Parsons, a lot of my students, they were fashion designers. And, you know, there's a lot of ideas that, okay, a fashion designer makes a garment for someone else. And we were trying to invert that process and to really make it a collaborative effort. And like, what would co-design? Like, what if you make a gar- made a garment with someone? Mm-hmm. And so we had done a project with the United Nations around health and co-design. And the Special Olympics had been at, you know, in a, an event as well and has a global footprint and kind of got wind of this project. And they asked if we would be, if they had anyone, you know, at Parsons that would be interested in this and for me, you know, I'll, I'll take that last part of the question first, like the DNA of who I am. Mm. I grew up as playing and loving sport. We talked a bit earlier about my love of surfing, but just in general, I have a deep love of, of a sport and the possibilities of physicality and movement and freedom. There are a lot of challenges that exist around sport culturally, but I think the Special Olympics embodies that what's beautiful and pure and incredible and expansive about sport. And so as soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, this would be an incredible partnership because what if the Special Olympics athletes led our students Mm -hmm. right, in a co-design process to reimagine uniforms that really address their unique needs? We all have unique needs. We don't have to be Special Olympians to Special Olympics athletes to feel like our garments aren't performing for us. Uh, Everyone has had that experience. And so we made this partnership and the Special Olympics athletes right before the pandemic would be coming into our classrooms, sharing with our students their experiences, what they need to perform better as athletes, what they would love. Our students were going to their ice skating practices. Emmy Freeze is an amazing figure skater in New York and she's one of the coaches. So we would go to their practices and... It was just the most extraordinary things. Our students would then, you know, use their ideas, make prototypes. We do fittings. And there was this unbelievable back and forth. But really, the Special Olympics athletes were the ones teaching our class. And the garments and the products that came out of it were extraordinary. And I want to, you know, share something amazing, not just for Special Olympics athletes. They develop profound ways that garments can perform better for all athletes. And mm-hmm. that, for me, that universal design idea was unpacked through that collaborative methodology. So it was fantastic. And yeah, just unbelievable to be involved in that and super grateful. And for our listeners out there who might be in the makerspace, maker mindset fields, 3D design software, how did that come into play? I'm trying to yes. imagine how that works with fashion, you know? Absolutely. So in fashion design, so much has been digital for a long time in terms of drawing your patterns and your designs and then being able to share those with manufacturing companies to get these things produced. In the last couple of years, there's been a huge advance, advancement in three-dimensional design. Mm. So instead of sort of like flat drawings for patterns, you can really visualize how garments can fit around a body and be engineered. And when the pandemic hit, there's a company called Clo 3 d that really has been at the forefront of it and that I had a great relationship with. And for the Special Olympics class, I thought this would be fantastic because then the Special Olympics athletes could really collaborate online with us uh, and engineer garments and we could do digital testing. And for our students, it gave them another medium to express themselves and also challenge themselves in a time when the world said, oh, well, you know, if we can't be in person and physically sewing garments together, what are we going to do? And so in that sense, the, the technology and the digital influence was, was fantastic. And I think, you know, in a way, what I love about it is the Special Olympics athletes led that innovative response. And a lot of the, the things that they talked about really did demand that level of technology to support some of their ideas, to translate those into reality. Wow, that's just... 
That's just so awesome and inspiring. And there's so many things that any educator listening could take away, most especially about developing partnerships and that whole process. So I'm going to, I'm going to squeeze in one more story about something that you did while you were at Parsons here. That's kind of along the same line. So one of the parts of your resume and story has to do with something called the UNFPA, Refugee Sustainable Menstrual Health System Co-Design Project, which took place between 2016 and 2021. And I found it, Brendan, almost impossible to formulate a specific question around this. So, sure. so let me ask this three-part question. So what was the design project? What did it mean to you? And maybe most importantly, in what ways were the students at Parsons who participated changed by this partnership between Parsons, UNFPA, and Hella Clothing? Absolutely. Yeah. So the UNFPA is the United Nations Population Fund. They're division of the United Nations. And it also, like the Special Olympics partnership, um, was just a, an incredible opportunity to reimagine inverting the hierarchy of design and how our world engages with each other. And so there was a very strong need identified by the United Nations in one of their camps in Kakuma, Kenya, which is the west uh, of Kenya, around different options needed to be created for menstrual health management and women's health care, particularly because single-use sanitary pads have a very, very long half-life. They don't biodegrade most of them. Mm. And so they were getting in the water supply. They're also causing infections. And so with the onset of a new technology around high-absorbency textiles, there are menstrual health underwear that are now available. And we we thought this would be an interesting moment to explore co-design. And mm. so with um, the incredible human beings of Kakuma, Kenya, who I like to say just happened to be refugees. The people in that refugee camp were doctors, lawyers, politicians, teachers that were displaced from their countries for different reasons, war, political conflict, just some of the most intense things. But they are all human beings that have strong identities and families. And refugee just happens to be a title that's placed on them. So I'd like to say, you know, who they are. And they mm -hmm. were our co-designers, these incredible human beings. So, you know, the environment of Kakuma has its own unique needs. And they went back and forth with our students and went to Kakuma, you know, and the idea really, you know, aside from developing menstrual health underwear in a co-design manner to offer another option for humans to, to address their menstrual health needs, our students and these awesome, incredible humans in Kakuma, Kenya, were, were solving amazing challenges. And the UN recognized that it wasn't just about a product at the end of the day. Yes, that, that product, the outcome of that incredible high absorbency underwear was important, but really it was about this educational process that has extraordinary capabilities of solution-based design and systems thinking. And I know those are buzzwords, but that's a very specific application of that and what's possible. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the United Nations actually started a course and we, we co-taught it around design in Kakuma, Kenya, in the refugee camp. We did it at distance and in person. And so for us, it was incredible. And just to finish very quickly is, but for our students, mm -hmm. when they got out of that project and went back into their studios, the garments, the projects they were designing just had a different level of empathy, criticality, rigor, and expansive possibilities for transforming our society. So that, sorry, just yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, both of those stories, and they're just two amongst many in your life, Brendan, are, are really extraordinary stories, the Special Olympics and the Menstrual Health Project. And I think you know, on the mainland, folks on the mainland, here, I'm in Honolulu, obviously, folks on the mainland call it goosebumps, or the, here in Hawaii, we call it chicken skin. When you hear stories like that, you just get that kind of goosebumpy feeling, because you realize that what you're hearing is about work that's being done for the greater good, for the good of people in the community. And I, I just feel so hopeful in this moment, Brendan, that education 
writ large is moving in that direction, that it's not just about a competitive process of learning a bunch of subjects and then, you know, gaining whatever you need to gain for your own life. It's really outwardly directed towards making the world a better place. And those two examples are just fabulous for that. So, okay. So, Brendan, we have time for a couple more questions here. You've already mentioned Leah Wu at Hanaholi School. She's the head of school there. And she urged me to ask you about a concept called the cloud school. So (laughs) as I did with one other guest, Parul Jagdish, let's go for a hot air balloon ride way, way up to 10,000 feet. So you can explain this idea to me uh, while at the right altitude, you know, in the clouds, we can, we can sip sparkling water while we're up there. So what is this cloud school thing, Brendan? Thanks for asking, and also a shout out to Leah for that prompt. I, I love it. We've had, you know, she inspired me so much through her leadership and and love and care of the students there. But the film that you watched and that you referenced earlier, this trailer for a school that I mentioned, where I kind of called up a bunch of people in different ways that I felt I loved, and went through a conceptual exercise of well, what what would it look like to design a school just with essentially my friends, my people I really love and care about and that have influenced me over the years of all ages, by the way, like a really intergenerational approach. That sort of morphed into this idea that you know, a school w- could be founded and generated through people you love. And so I, I, I sort of had this funny Walter Mitty working title of this cloud school, maybe this idea that I haven't quite figured out what, what it looks like, but everywhere I go, it morphs. And at Hanahaoli, that cloud school, uh, I thought, was you know very abstract in my mind, and you know I, I would start it in ten years after you know I get a lot of funding from all these billionaires on Wall Street and blah blah blah, whatever it is. I realized that that film festival was cloud school as well. It was a bunch of amazing human beings, two hundred seventeen children making films about what they love, and then it was this amazing faculty and family community that gathered around to watch those. And then, as we discussed earlier, that moment where they started dreaming about what's next for their school based on love. And now I've been working with the Progressive Philosophy Program through their Philosophy for Children initiative in Waikiki Elementary, Ka'elepulu Elementary, Kailua High School, and Sunset Elementary, which are all public schools in Hawaii that are working on this Philosophy for Children initiative. And I can't stop looking at that as such a beautiful example of change, of love and schools. And so anyways, the long story short is this cloud school keeps morphing in my mind of what could be, and it keeps existing in different ways. But I keep coming back to this this film festival as a, a transformative possibility for maybe mm-hmm. what school could be. Yeah, me too. I was thinking that while you were describing initially your your cloud school concept, I I just had a feeling that you were going to go back to the to the film festival. That feels like such a a giant sort of philosophical event. Really, it's an explosion of ideas, and I I love that, Brendan. I just I'm excited. We will all of us us listeners are going to be excited to hear how this plays out for you in the future. And I think actually it's a perfect segue to this final question. And Brendan, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. You've just put enough fuel in my tank to last for months. <laughs> so as I noted in the beginning, at the end of these episodes, I like to give guests a chance to talk about a giant upon whose shoulders they stand. But in your case, I'm going to ask you to talk about your little sister, Justine, who you wrote about at the top of your resume, which is significant. You have a paragraph at the top of your resume. So who is Justine? In what ways has she been your teacher? And what will she bring to the veterinary medicine profession as she continues her studies at UPenn? Thanks, Josh, for asking about Justine. Yeah, you're right. I do. I have, I'm really lucky in life. I have this really long academic CV with all these fancy degrees and places and amazing partnerships. And I'm proud of all of those things. I I worked really hard for all of them. And I, you know, like the UN and Special Olympics are all on there. But 
I put this little passage about Justine at the top of the resume because, you know, all of those things are important, but the most important thing in my life is my relationship to her. She has navigated some of the most complex, difficult challenges that humans face, particularly from a health perspective, and has come through them in the most amazing way. School was not easy for her growing up. And after a long journey and really looking inside of who she was, her deep passion for animals, she became initially a veterinary technician, veterinary nurse, and has gone on this unbelievable journey of really not loving school at all or, or even being able to be successful in, let's say, academic you know, science and math to doing not only well, but extraordinary and going essentially reinventing the wheel, going back to school for all that and found her way and got in successfully to UPenn Vet, vet school, veterinary school that is, and is just doing phenomenal work. And I guess it's that journey, um, her life um, and the things that she's faced and gone through that has taught me so much that all the other stuff, well, I, like I said, I'm proud of, I learn from her on the daily of what love looks like, of what, what it really means. And also to be kind of technical, since we're, we're on a podcast about school, to actually learn what love, and we were talking about neuroscience earlier, can do in relationship to some of these unbelievably complex academic subjects. And, and not just to accomplish, whether it's biochem or organic chemistry in her case and all those things, not just to know them, but actually to know the extraordinary power and beauty that those subjects hold in our world and what they can do for others. And in her case, animals and the people who love those animals in our world. And Josh, I, you know, I've been doing this technical analysis of the film festival at Hanaholi. Over 50% of the children had their films were about animals. Mm. So that tells me something real specific about how we can change schools. And, and I know it on an anecdotal level for my sister, but it's mounting. And, you know, you asked me about cloud school and I thought for the longest time, you know, it would be this school that's outside like a case study school. Some people have heard of Black Mountain College or all of these epic case studies that exist outside of school. And I think what I, I, did, I failed to articulate in that last answer uh, about cloud school is that I actually think cloud school already exists. It's, it's already in the kids. And I just, I, I think filmmaking um, is a great way, but any way that we can figure out like, like Justine did what, what really exists inside her and the a power for love to overcome really difficult situations. And even mm -hmm. from a neurobiological point of view with school is something that maybe that's what clouds, maybe Justine if, I, if I'm going to be open and try not to cry, but maybe Justine is cloud school. Mm. And for that very reason, why don't we just dedicate this episode to Justine? Because she's brought it to a close in a most epic way. We can just think of cloud school as inside us. We just have to figure out how we come together to figure out who we are and what we love and what we want to learn and how much fun we can have. As we're exactly. doing that, right? As right, absolutely, absolutely. So, Brendan, thank you for your time today. This has been an absolute blast. So, we at What School Could Be hoped to spot you running by us in your tux and red <laughs> shoes, a long line of young people following you into the lands of wonder and inquiry. And so, thank you for this time today. It's been a real treat. And please, you and your extended family, stay safe and in good health. Thank you so much, Josh. It's been an absolute honor. And yeah, I just want to share all my love and energy right back at you and the entire What School Could Be community and all those people who tune in and listen and do what they love every single day and help other people in our schools try to find what they love and, and shake this world up. That's awesome. Thank you. My editor, creative consultant, and sound engineer is the talented Evan Kurahara. Our theme music and musical interludes come from the vast catalog of music created by my friend of 40 years, the remarkable pianist Michael Sloan. Producer of 12 albums with over 100 songs, Michael Sloan is featured in Apple Music, Spotify, and all major music platforms. You can also find his work at his YouTube channel. Michael has listeners in over 100 countries and over 2,000 cities to date. 
Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. This series is underwritten by education change agent Ted Dintersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. Please join the What School Could Be global online community by going to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or by downloading the What School Could Be app from your favorite app store. The What School Could Be podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Send your feedback to josh at whatschoolcouldbe.org. Follow the show on Twitter at WSCB Podcast. Friends, these are uncertain and challenging times. The headlines, especially around education, can be relentlessly negative. Please bring kindness, compassion, innovation, creativity, and imagination into the world. We need a surplus of all of these right now. Until the next episode, ahui ho, and take care. <laughs>